on this Saturday night, calling for change in Iran, around the world, and right here in Canada. Women's life, freedom! Women's life, freedom! Protesters not backing down. From respected filmmaker to living in a tent, new details about the man accused of killing an RCMP officer. Taking a bite out of inflation. Why some experts say switching grocery stores could be a smart choice. And siren call. We're the next generation of um, stewards of the land. How a firefighting course could be the beginning of meaningful careers for Indigenous youth. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Tens of thousands of people gathered in cities around the world today to show solidarity with protesters in Iran. For more than a month, Iranians have been taking to the streets in anti-government demonstrations sparked by the death of Masa Amini. The 22-year-old died after being arrested by the so-called morality police for wearing her hijab too loosely. One of the largest demonstrations today was in Berlin. There are tens of thousands of people packed into the city, some traveling to Germany from other countries, including Canada, to show support. Mike Drolet has more on the growing worldwide momentum and the response from Iran. Protests condemning the regime in Iran are nothing new, but all this feels different. Toronto's large Iranian diaspora took to the streets to demand change within Iran. Delivering the same message on political and human rights as groups did in Halifax and other cities across Canada. European cities saw similar protests. By far the largest was in Berlin, with 80,000 people speaking for one. I am Masa Amini's voice. Masa Amini was 22 years old when she was detained in mid-September by Iran's morality police for not wearing a hijab correctly. Her suspicious death while in custody set off a series of protests and riots throughout the country. <laughs> which five weeks later continue to gather steam. On Friday night, protesters chanted for a regime change in the normally quiet city of Zaidan. Hardline clerics within Iran have urged security forces to respond with force, and they've obliged. Over 200 protesters have reportedly been killed and thousands more arrested. Facing pressure at the United Nations, Iran was unequivocal. Stay out of our business. Therefore, we advise those Western states that they are not required to act as guardians or caretakers of Iranian women or speak on their behalf. Yet enough women in Iran are doing just that by publicly and defiantly cutting off their hair. <laughs> and this week, the regime faced yet another crisis when professional climber Elnaz Rakabi competed in South Korea without her hijab. <laughs> All eyes were on her when she returned to Tehran, where she said she had made a mistake and forgot to wear it, a statement human rights groups believe was coerced. They now worry she's under house arrest, unable to speak her mind. Which is why these protests show no signs of letting up. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. China's president has strengthened his power this week and cementing his status in the country's ruling Communist Party. The once in five years Congress amended the party's constitution to solidify Xi Jinping's role, but the usually highly choreographed meeting included an unexpected element. The president's immediate predecessor, Hu Jintao, was escorted out of the closing ceremony. The 79-year-old had been seated next to Xi and looked distressed as he was led off stage by two men. Chinese state media is reporting that Tu was removed because he felt unwell. And we're learning more details about a man accused of killing RCMP constable Shailin Yang in British Columbia this week. Zhang Wan Ham had been living in a tent in a park. But before that, he lived and worked in Toronto as an award-winning filmmaker. Rumina Dea has the details on what a friend close to Ham describes as a downward spiral. How did 37-year-old Zhang Wan Ham go from talented actor and Emmy award-winning filmmaker to living in a tent in Burnaby, now charged with the first-degree murder of RCMP Constable Shailin Yang? 
An impressive resume of film and television work spanning nearly a decade. Ham, starring here in a Korean short film for which he won the Audience Choice Award in 2013. One of Ham's close friends tells us he's devastated. He says Ham was falsely accused of sex assault in Toronto years ago, and the strain of that investigation sent Ham to a dark place. A social media post on Ham's page saying, what's next, entrapment? Global News has confirmed with police sources in B.C. and Ontario, Ham was charged with sexual assault in Toronto in 2014. But it took three years before the charge was withdrawn. For Ham, catastrophic damage had been done. A mental health downward spiral ensued. Ham lost contact with friends and disappeared from social media four years ago. Somehow, he makes his way west. According to court documents, Ham was living in Vancouver near Kingsway and Knight Street. Ham was sharing penthouse number three with a roommate. Then in January of last year, a 911 call. Police confirmed the roommate was worried for his safety because of an alleged death threat. A neighbor tells us Ham was paranoid. He agrees to leave the building. A string of charges follows. Assault, resisting a police officer, and assault again in March of this year. In and out of jail, Ham now living in a tent, washing his socks in the fountain. He had been removed from the park, but was back. Another warning to leave coming down Tuesday, when Constable Yang is killed. A shocking fall from grace for a respected rising star. Ham's next appearance will be in a Vancouver courtroom November 2nd to deal with the murder charge. Romina Dea, Global News. Turning now to the war in Ukraine, Russian officials are warning residents in the southern city of Kherson to leave immediately ahead of an expected Ukrainian advance. Over the last few days, thousands of people have been leaving the city by crossing a major river. They are being moved deeper into Russian-held territory. Ukrainian forces are hoping to retake the city, which has been under Russian control since the early days of the war. The cost of food is a big concern right now. Food inflation has surged to a 41-year high, climbing faster than overall inflation, which has cooled slightly in the past few weeks. That's forced households to cut back on dining out and on groceries. Many wonder if switching grocery stores can help them save even more. And Gaviola has more on what the experts are suggesting. Brand loyalty is out. Saving on your grocery bill is in. We're seeing an uptick uh, in uh, consumers wanting to shop at lower end grocery stores, though places where they may not have all the bells and whistles because they're getting a better price. Food inflation means your dollars don't go as far as they used to. The days of shopping where you've always shopped because it's close to home or work are over for many. I see between stores which one are cheaper mm -hmm. and I go there. Cereal, pasta and baked goods prices are up about 18% in the past year. Fresh fruit, 13% more expensive. Fresh vegetables, 12%. For a lot of us, it now means buying frozen. The nutrients, the, the goodness in them is, is locked in. They may not look as good or as taste as good as the fresh, um, but they're typically cheaper. Prices of citrus fruits, berries, nuts, lettuce, all items we import from the U.S. and Mexico are going to continue climbing as winter weather adds time and cost to transporting them. The weaker Canadian dollar is a factor too. So are rising fertilizer, pesticide and labour costs. Loblaw announced a price freeze on 1,500 no-name brand items, and Metro says it's not accepting price increases from suppliers for the next three months. Critics call these PR moves that make headlines but don't reduce your bills. But they're freezing prices at these elevated levels. It's not like they're bringing prices down and actually making a difference. Switching from a full-service grocer with lots of prepared food options to something more basic is one way to save, but not if it involves paying more for gas. If you're having to travel across town or, or drive long distances to get a, one cheaper product, you, you know, you're spending a lot on fuel, uh, that's a bit of a waste of money. Instead, pay attention to the cost per unit, which will make you savvier at spotting real deals and not getting duped by shrinkflation. With the Bank of Canada likely to roll out another big rate hike in an effort to tame inflation, this labour economist says low-income households are on the brink.
If we don't do more, more people are going to go hungry and have to make a choice actually between heating and eating in the coming months because of what's happening to gas prices and what's happening to the prices of basic foodstuffs. The cost of living pushing more Canadians to make difficult decisions. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Coming up, warning signs how Quebec is working to prevent future deaths after a string of murders of children. The grisly murders of two children by their own father this week in Quebec has left people asking how these deaths can be prevented. Just last month, another father was charged with murdering his children and his wife. Experts say events like these happen all too frequently in that province. And as Amanda Jelowicki reports, they say more resources are needed and warning signs need heeding. Outside this home on a quiet neighborhood street north of Montreal, a makeshift memorial grows, a mark of inexplicable sadness for the horror that happened inside. Police arrested and charged Kemaljit Aurora with murdering his 13-year-old daughter and 11-year-old son. Innocent children being killed, this is unheard of. I mean, what are we becoming here? Quebec has a grisly history of high-profile filicides. The case of cardiologist Guy Turcotte captivated the country. After separating from his wife, he slaughtered his two children. Two years ago, a province-wide manhunt for Martin Carpentier ended when police found the bludgeoned bodies of his two daughters. The province was left bereft after Jonathan Pomeras butchered his two children in 2019. You've heard the term zero to 100. They don't go from zero to 100. Um, they're already at 75. Darylton James runs a domestic violence clinic focused on men. He points to many obstacles in helping them. The major challenge is engaging them to begin with. They often tend to minimize, um, often have very little self-awareness or insight into their own behavior. Around 30 to 40 kids in Canada are killed each year by their parents. Experts say partner violence often leads to violence against children. Three quarters of child homicides are predictable and preventable. When parents kill children, it's never out of the blue. There's usually warning signs. Those warnings include a history of depression or mental health issues, addiction, issues around separation, and repeated domestic violence. While the violence is continuing, there should be less contact between the spouses and less manipulation of the children. We have to learn lessons from these tragedies. You know, we can't bring back children who are gone, but we should be working damn hard to make sure we prevent future deaths. Deaths that leave everybody asking why. Amanda Jalawicki, Global News, Montreal. Ahead, the mighty Mississippi drying up. How drought for one of the largest rivers in the U.S. could have an effect on the economy. In the U.S., the worst drought in at least a decade has caused water levels in the Mississippi River to drop to historic lows, slowing down America's supply chain. The mighty river supports a $12.6 billion shipping industry and tens of thousands of jobs, but is going dry in several sections. And as Jennifer Johnson reports, shipping delays will mean even higher consumer costs. The mighty Mississippi, America's second largest river, is not mighty anymore. Drought conditions are bringing this vital transportation waterway to a halt. Over 120 vessels and more than 1,800 barges are backed up because of at least four closures. Well, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It, it is, it's bad. We know how important this economic impact is to the United States. Massive barges carrying everything from crops to steel are crawling along or stopped. Delays will further drive up consumer costs at a time when inflation is at its highest level in 40 years. Food prices are going up. Energy prices might be impacted. Those are the implications for people, I think, on a day-to-day -day basis. 60% of all grain exported from the U.S. goes down this river to New Orleans and is shipped worldwide. Farmers who can't move their crops are seeing their profits dry up. Causing us to, to even lose money, you know, on the crop that we grew. Roger Smith estimates the shipping delays and cancellations will cost him $40,000 this year. Parts of the river, like in Memphis, Tennessee, are at their lowest level in 70 years. Maybe your record lows, a little lower than normal. Uh, I would say that this year, uh, 
and it fits that description. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been brought in to regulate traffic and deepen channels to keep barges from running aground. Sometimes a walking path, <laughs> it, it can get that severe. But while industries wait and hope no major barge gets stuck shutting the whole waterway down, archaeologists are making discoveries they never imagined. Century-old shipwrecks are coming to life as the waters recede. 15 years I've been an office-bound bureaucrat, and so this is one of the cooler things I've seen in those 15 years. Unfortunately, rain hasn't been seen too often either, and industries that rely on this river are hoping Mother Nature will come to the rescue. But significant amounts of precipitation are not in the forecast, as this river, which runs through 10 states, continues to shrink. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Next, Igniting Careers, how a BC-based training program is helping to spark interest for young Canadians to get into firefighting. Recent rain and the cooler temperatures we've seen across Canada are bringing some relief to what's been a fierce and long-running fire season. In B.C., where more than 200 fires are still burning, a training program is hoping to ignite interest for young Canadians to become firefighters. It's a profession that will likely be relied on more heavily going forward. The course is open to anyone, but as Kylie Stanton reports, it's hoped that First Nations youth in particular hear the siren call. This turns on. They start with the basics and work their way up. Participants here are learning the ins and outs of fighting fires. You want to come down your body. But the real goal is to light a spark. So far we've learned a lot about the equipment. This is going to be a relay race. Yeah, 60 seconds each essentially. Let's go! How to put it on and take it off. We just did some communication drills with the walkie-talkies. Stretch them out. The First Nations Emergency Services Society's Fire Prevention Youth Food Camp has everyone fired up. A three-day course, possibly the start of some long and meaningful careers. We feel that the First Nations youth can be the, the future, the stewards of the land moving forward and um, able to protect their homes and communities. With the number of volunteer firefighters on the decline and those who came before them getting older, the knowledge is ready to be passed on. They know the land, they know the culture. And the demand only continues to grow. Not only just structure firefighting, but BC wildfire and uh, all the different aspects of those. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, First Nations have been making the land safer for everyone through cultural burning practices. And the purpose of this is actually to reduce some fuel loading. If done properly, it helps to thin out the forests, get rid of the fuels while releasing nutrients. Bring the hose line around. The hope is by opening the door here, it will ignite something in First Nations youth. Excellent. Someone else grab the food. Ultimately, bringing them back to their land. We're the next generation of um, stewards of the land, so it's important to um, remember that um, as we move forward. Water! <laughs> Stanton, the news. And that's Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Farah Nasser. On behalf of our whole team here at Global National, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is near Mata, BC. We love seeing Your Canada, so please keep emailing us those photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night.